session and can I remind members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. Uh, members, I want to advise you that there are just the three members attending the meeting in person today. Uh, Emma Shear and myself, the Chair, Mike Nesbitt, Vice Chair and Michelle McElveen. We have uh, apologies from Christopher Stalford. And the following members are attending via video conference. Paula Bradshaw and John O'Dowd, who's attempting in his capacity as Carol McCullen's deputy whilst she stands in for Deirdre Hargy, the Minister for Communities. And Mark, who we think is joining late. So we can get notification when Mark uh, joins the meeting via Starleaf. So we're using Starleaf. I would ask all members to ensure that their mobile phone is on Wi-Fi so that we don't have interference with the facilities. Um, I'd like to remind members that I will invite you to speak before you can be seen and heard in the meeting. And if you wish to speak, you should raise your hand uh, using the function to alert me and I'll add you to the spotlight to allow others to see and hear you. If you no longer wish to speak, please use the lower your hand function. Um, if anybody's using Starleaf on their mobile or only phoning in, they won't have the hands up facility, so I don't think that that applies unless Mark Durkin uh, uses it. So I'll be letting the witnesses know when I'm bringing them in. So agenda item one is apologies and we have apologies from Christopher Stalford. Um, so we can move to the second item on your agenda. Um, we have a briefing today from uh, Professor Kate O'Regan on the South African Bill of Rights. You'll recall at our last meeting we agreed to hear from witnesses before we deal with other committee business so that we uh, so we'll now move on to agenda item two, which is a briefing from Professor Kate O'Regan. Professor Kate O'Regan served as a judge on the South African Constitutional Court between 1994 and 2009, and Kate is now the director of the Bonavero, if I've pronounced that right, Institute of yeah. Human Rights at the University of Oxford. So the clerk's memo, along uh, with Kate's written submission, which she's provided us with, can be found at page four of your meeting papers. And there you'll find uh, a preamble, founding provisions and the Bill of Rights within the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. So I'd like to welcome Kate to the, to the meeting. Kate, thank you very much for joining us uh, today and thanks for your submission, which I'm sure members will agree was very interesting. Um, and if you're ready, you could begin your briefing. Great. Well, thanks very much, Chair, and it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, join your committee to talk about the process in, by which South Africa adopted a Bill of Rights. Um, I have sent you a briefing document, but what I thought I'd do is just go through the key uh, provisions of that. So one was to emphasise how important history is, I think, when one's drafting a Bill of Rights. Um, secondly, I thought I'd talk about the key structural provisions of the Bill of Rights, which I think are are interesting and that I think have largely been a success and I'd be happy to explain in greater detail if there are questions about that, about why I think so, but I'll just take you through them. Then thirdly, because the mandate of the ad hoc committee is to look particularly at rights that may be supplementary to those contained in the European Convention, I thought I would look at what I think the rights are in the South African Bill of Rights, which um, could arguably be said to be supplementary to the rights, at least explicitly, contained in the European Convention. And finally, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the adjudication of economic and social rights, in particular under the South African Constitution, because that's one of the uh, relatively unusual and relatively novel aspects of the South African jurisprudence. But I'm also happy to talk about um, other aspects of it, if that would be helpful to the members of the committee. Um, so to start in with my account of history, and. I think that um, South Africa's history, pre-colonial history, um, in, in a sense, when South Africa was a trading station um, under the Dutch East India Company, which really began in the mid-17th century, um, through its colonial experience when it was uh, taken on as a colony by Britain in the early 19th century, through to uh, um, the Union of South Africa, the formal establishment of it as a one country in 1910, the apartheid era, and then into the um, struggle against apartheid and the post-democratic, uh, the post-apartheid era, the democratic era from 1994. This history has influenced both the text of our Bill of Rights, but also the um, 
application interpretation uh, and issues that arise because the history, of course, has driven the social and economic realities of the present and to some extent the political realities of the present. And bills of rights and courts often are places where the key uh, contemporary issues where um, of kind of burning importance arise. Certainly that has been the case in South Africa, and I think one can see that uh, in both national jurisdictions and regional jurisdictions like the European Court of Human Rights as well. So that history in South Africa is very much a history of racial exclusion, racial discrimination, a process of uh, land deprivation, which took, uh, as I say in the briefing, really uh, at, at its most intense the, from the late 18th century till the end or the th uh, third quarter or uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, accompanied by a pattern of settlement in South Africa by, by farmers largely uh, of European descent who came from the United Kingdom, but also from, from Germany, from France, uh, and from other parts uh, of Europe, um, and always constituted a relatively small minority demographically, but came to be allocated land. Uh, it, the vast majority of land in South Africa was allocated for ownership and occupation by white South Africans. Um, it's interesting to know that because people often talk about apartheid, but actually the process began long before that during the colonial period. And some of it was a process of wars, particularly against the closer people of the Eastern Cape. Um, there were a long series of wars between um, the early 19th century or the late 18th century even and the mid 19th century before um, that, that those communities were, were vanquished effectively. Um, and again, wars between the British Empire and the Zulu people uh, in, the, in 1879, 1880. And then again, of course, wars between the British Empire and the Boer nations, the Boer nations being made up of the descendants of the original Dutch settlers from the 17th century. Um, and that was a you know, well-known war in 1899 to 1902. So that, that was a history of, of uh, dispossession through uh, warfare and settlement, and also through law. One of the most important pieces of legislation that was enacted shortly after Union, Union came about in 1910, the four colonies of South Africa then were unionized into one colony, the, uh, the, the uh, Union of South Africa. Um, one of the most important pieces of legislation was the, what was called the Natives Land Act. And under that, as I've indicated already, 87% of South African land was set aside for the occupation and ownership of white people, who at the time would have constituted less than a quarter of the population. Um, today, to give you an idea, the white population of South Africa constitutes about 8% of the overall population. So that's been a declining proportion uh, over the last century. But um, the uh, Land Act reserved most land uh, for white South Africans. And that was really the culmination in many ways of the the process of colonial dispossession. Apartheid as a policy actually only really was uh, um, enunciated in the 1940s after the Second World War um, by the National Party, who came to power in um, a minority government or with, by minority, with a minority of votes, actually, in 1948, but consolidated their power in the dec decades that followed. And they built and entrenched patterns of racial discrimination in the law. Um, and the consequent, and that was right across social life. Education, if you looked at the amount of money that was spent on education for white children, it was in the region uh, of 10 times what was spent on black children. And there actually were under apartheid four racial groups identified, uh, black African, people of mixed race, uh, who are called coloured South Africans, still a word in use and the community itself uses it, very much based in the Northern Cape and Western Cape, and many of them descendants of slaves brought during the Dutch period from the, from, uh, the East Indies, from um, Java, Indonesia, Malaysia. Um, and that community has that uh, heritage back into um, very much the Muslim populations of Southeast Asia. And then um, in addition to that, there is a quite a large population of Indian descent who were brought as so often across the British Empire to work as indentured laborers in the sugar fields of the province of what is now KwaZulu-Natal on the east coast of South Africa at the end of the 19th century. 
So if I looked at apartheid, there was a sort of hierarchy between the racial groups in terms of expenditure on education, for example, or healthcare or housing, with black Africans being the most discriminated against and receiving the least in terms of state support and benefits. The legacy of that, um, those policies are, are with us still, um, and they have really informed um, um, the kind of the, re the current social and economic realities and also to some extent the political realities. So if you look at our constitution, you can see that it is, it in many ways is um, speaking both to the past and the future. And, and it starts with a preamble um, which talks about um, um, that we recognize the injustices of the past. We want to honor those who suffer for justice and freedom in our land and respect those who've worked to build and develop it and we want to heal the freedom, uh, sorry, um, heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. So you see that sense of talking to the past very distinctively in the South African constitution. And that uh, is also echoed in, um, in the Bill of Rights itself. The, the first substantive clause in the Bill of Rights is the equality clause. And that really is responding to the deep patterns of inequality that um, mar our society as a result of the history of colonialism and apartheid. So I say all of that not presuming at all um, to say, you know, what that should mean in Northern Ireland, but just to say that I, I, I think it's hard to avoid history when one is doing a Bill of Rights. The other striking similarity, I suppose, um, in relation to South Africa and Northern Ireland is that this, the process of adopting the constitution was a process of negotiation and discussion and was eventually widely, um, uh, wide, I'm so apologize, I thought I put on not to stir. Um, it was widely um, uh, agreed, the contents of the constitution were, were widely agreed. Um, so that that history, apologies, I'm sorry. Um, that history, um, it, it, you know, the the, the, the po political process around adopting the constitution was an important one, and one which not only did involve people who were in political parties, but the there was a wide consultation across South Africa, both with organisations who are um, who were involved in different walks of life, so women's organizations, rural communities, urban, um, urban dwellers, um, different religions, different faiths, um, uh, different racial groups um, were all involved in kind of being consulted on the text of the constitution. So the process is a very interesting one, although not adopted by referendum, um, actually adopted by the first democratic parliament sitting as a constitutional assembly. So turning then to what I think are the distinctive and have been largely the um, successful aspects of our Bill of Rights, because although South Africa remains a complicated place um, and with lots that are to, to tr trouble us, including COVID-19, like it's troubling everybody, um, the, the actual text of the Constitution, I would say, has been a success and the Bill of Rights has been a success. And again, that's not to say we're a... We're a very uh, um, opinionated society, and you will find many people who will criticize aspects of the text. But I think criticism that comes to any element of the text now is largely criticism driven by frustration with our inability to address the real legacies of the past. And my own view is that those criticisms would be better placed elsewhere than at the door of the Constitution, which I don't think could be said to have been a major um, barrier to addressing the legacy of the past. So what are those provisions in the, in the structure? So firstly, in my briefing note, I've described the range of rights. So we very much are, were able to build on the experience of constitution making, bill of rights drafting of the post-war period. And that is visible in many as aspects of our bill of rights, but most particularly in the range of rights. So in addition to the civil and political rights that are contained in the European Convention, for example, and in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there are also economic, social, and cultural rights. There are also what some people refer to as third-generation rights, such as the right to a safe environment, safe and healthy environment, and a recognition in the environmental clause of the rights of future generations. And there is a right to administrative justice and a right of access to information. <clears throat> 
So it's a very broad ranging uh, Bill of Rights, all of which are justiciable. We don't, we haven't followed the model, for example, of the Republic of Ireland with directive principles uh, in our constitution. We, everything in the constitution is justiciable before the courts. Uh, secondly, um, all the rights we have, unlike the European Convention, which works on a distinction between absolute and qualified rights, in the South African framework, like the Canadian Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms, all rights uh, are subject to a general limitations clause. And that means that the process for adjudicating a rights case is to determine, firstly, whether there has been a limitation of a right uh, in the Bill of Rights, and then secondly, whether that limitation has been caused by a law of general application that is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on dignity, equality, and freedom. And more or less, that is a proportionality analysis. Having a general limitations clause does mean, therefore, that quite a lot of the work that may be done in a constitution that doesn't have a limitations clause definitionally in terms of working out whether the right covers something or not is done in the South African constitution often under the limitations clause. Um, it doesn't mean that definitions in our Bill of Rights aren't important. We don't leap over them and just include anything in the definition. But limitations means that a lot of the work, particularly where there's been limitation by the state for a particular reason, is done under the limitations analysis. And that extends to the right to life, freedom from torture, which of course would be considered to be absolute rights under the European Convention. The third um, key uh, or distinctive element of our constitution is that although there is this gen general limitations clause, there are also internal, what I call really definitional provisions in the rights themselves. So if you look at the rights, certain things are excluded. And I think in my, um, uh, in my briefing paper to you, I gave the example of our freedom of expression clause, Article 16, which somewhat like Article 10 of the European Convention, um, protects everyone has the right to freedom of exp expression, including freedom of the press and other media, freedom to receive or impart information or ideas, freedom of artistic creativity, and academic freedom and freedom of scientific research but then goes on to say the right does not extend to propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, or advocacy of hatred based on race, ethnicity, gender, or religion, and that constitutes incitement to cause harm. And um, conceptually, I think the way to understand this internal limitation or this qualification is in fact as an internal definitional carve out of the ambit of the right. So it's definitional. And you find that in various provisions of the rights. You can actually cut out from the protection of the right explicit forms of conduct that there might be some argument would otherwise fall within the right. And that's quite a distinctive feature of the South African constitution. And that means that if you have an example of hate speech, for example, the first question will be, is it hate speech that falls in the exclusionary part of um, section 16? Um, and if it is, then that's the end of the matter, kind of question, because um, it's not protected at all. But if it's considered to be a form of hate speech that falls short of the advocacy of hatred that constitutes incitement to cause harm, it may constitute speech, but if there's been state limitation on it, then the question will be whether that limitation is reasonable and justifiable under the limitations clause. The um, fourth aspect of our Bill of Rights, which I think is worth looking at, is the explicit provision in the Bill of Rights as to how to go about interpreting the rights. And that's to be found, um, as I said in my note, in section 39 of the, um, of the uh, Bill of Rights, which says, firstly, that in interpreting the Bill of Rights or any rights within it, um, courts must promote the values that underlie an open and democratic society. So uh, based on dignity, equality, and freedom, this, this, these triumvirate of values, human dignity, equality, and freedom, are used at the interpretive level. They're used again in terms of understanding limitations and determining whether a limitation is justifiable. And each one of them also constitutes a freestanding right itself. So it's, a, it's not unlike the Canadian Charter, but it's a distinct emphasis on human dignity, equality, and freedom um, as guiding the interpretation uh, of the Bill of Rights. But also the Bill of Rights says that in interpreting the Bill of Rights, the courts must consider international law. 
Now, in some senses, must and consider are slightly um, contradictory terms. And so the Constitutional Court has held that the courts should look at international law, and that does not need to be only international law that, or conventions that South Africa has ratified. It can include um, treaty body decisions. It can include soft law. But then it's simply to take them into account. The court is not, courts are not bound by international law under this provision. It's a consideration provision. But it puts beyond question the legitimacy of courts drawing on international human rights law in interpreting the Bill of Rights. And then secondly, it also says that the courts may consider foreign law and um, comparative, the law of comparative jurisdictions. And that's been a very useful provision. Again, it puts outside the debate the question that has been troubling in the United States, which whether it, whether it is legitimate for the United States Supreme Court to consider the jurisprudence of other jurisdictions in interpreting the US Constitution, um, and makes it clear that it is a legitimate exercise. But again, it's not that it, the courts don't look at foreign jurisprudence as binding authority. They look at them for, as it were, jurisprudential inspiration and guidance. And um, the courts have you looked at a very wide range of jurisdictions. Uh, the European Convention itself, with its very rich um, jurisprudence, has been repeatedly cited in South African courts. The Canadian uh, jurisprudence, the American Indian jurisprudence, jurisprudence of the um, of um, the under the Irish Constitution, as well as jurisprudence from elsewhere in Africa, Kenya, Namibia. Um, and Botswana, for example. And um, so this is an, a helpful interpretive clause, which I think has been drawn on um, um, uh, regularly by the courts. The next element is um, obligations, which is who bears obligations under the Bill of Rights? Now, of course, traditionally under Bills of Rights, it's the state that bears obligations. And that's very clear under the South African Constitution. It's set out specifically in Section 8.1, the second of the provisions of the Bill of Rights, um, and says that all three arms of government and all spheres of government, so South African government is divided into national, provincial, and local government, and all three spheres of government are carry obligations under the Bill of Rights. But in perhaps one of the less clear provisions of the Constitution, private persons too can bear obligations under the Bill of Rights. Um, Section 8.2 states that to the extent that the right is applicable to private actors, taking into account the nature of the right and any duty imposed by it. Mostly, this has not actually produced as much difficulty as I think a lot of commentators thought it would, partly because um, the court takes a, a view um, that of uh, recognizing that where Parliament has imposed obligations on actors, which would be seen as obligations that would flow from the Bill of Rights, generally the court will follow a principle of subsidiarity and use the obligations in the legislation to determine the content of the, of the rights of private citizens. But it, um, it's an interesting provision that I draw to your attention. Uh, the nature of the duties, of course, are both negative and positive duties, again, consistent with or similar to the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and that's explicitly stated um, in Section uh, 8 of the Constitution. Standing to sue is very broadly formulated expressly in the Bill of Rights. It, it makes clear that a wide range of persons and in institutions can bring can approach courts for appropriate relief. The feeling here was that given our history and given the nature of society and the difficulty of getting cases to court, uh, rigid um, standing provisions which prevented people bringing cases would undermine the constitutional project, which undoubtedly is a transformative project trying to bring justice to uh, South Africa. And again, although I think some commentators thought that the courts would be swamped and that this was too broad a provision, in practice, 25 years later, we can say that actually it's been a reasonably successful provision, which I, I would not hesitate to, to reproduce if, if, if asked. And finally, and I think importantly, are the provisions relating to relief and remedies. These are not contained in the Bill of Rights, although Section 38 of the Bill of Rights does say that anybody may obtain appropriate relief. But in the body of the Constitution itself contains the main remedial provision which is that courts must declare um, conduct and legislation that is inconsistent with the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, to be invalid. And, have, and the court have expressly got powers to suspend orders of invalidity, 
to make the retrospectivity limited or to make them prospective only and to give other forms of just and equitable relief. And again, I think the remedial provision of the South African constitution has been very successful in practice and there are very few people that I've seen who suggest that it warrants, you know, that, that it's not, not in fact been fit for purpose, certainly in our first 25 years. So those are the sort of structural provisions that I think one shouldn't underestimate when one's thinking of drafting a Bill of Rights, how these sort of, in some ways, less exciting, more nuts and bolts, more toolkit kind of aspects of a Bill of Rights require consideration in addition to thinking about the substantive rights one wants to protect. Um, and then the key rights that I think have been protected under the South African Constitution, which arguably, and one of the problems, as I say in the briefing paper, is that, of course, the, you can look at the text of the original convention and you can look at the protocols and you can look at the jurisprudence of the European Court and see that there has been an elasticity to what is protected under the, the convention um, over its 70 years of existence. Um, so I've sort of identified things that I think are, have either been protected in a, distinct, a distinctively different way to the way they're protected under the European Convention or things that are not protected at all. Um, the first is a strong equality clause. Um, Section 9 of the South African Constitution, unlike Article 14 of the European Convention, is a very strong equality clause. It also contains within it affirmative action provision, um, Section 9.2, and I could talk more about that if there are questions about that. It also contains a provision which says that ordinary individuals bear an obligation to act consistently with the equality clause, that is not to discriminate on the grounds that are listed in the equality clause. It's a long, open-ended list of grounds and requires Parliament to enact legislation to give effect to that obligation on private citizens and companies, which Parliament has done in, in our um, prevention of um, unfair discrimination and promotion of equality legislation. So mostly the private uh, question of private obligations under equality clause are dealt with under our Equality Act, not directly under the Constitution. Secondly, the Constitution protects the right to dignity. As I've said, it's also a value under the Constitution, and there's, there's some conceptual debates about whether this works or doesn't work, but um, my sense has been that given the deeply a deep indignity of the patterns of racial discrimination, it, it's a very powerful uh, framing of an understanding of the constitutional setting and has actually been called upon by the courts often and at times used to grant relief. We don't have a family clause, for example, a right to family, right to found a family. I think there was kind of concerns at the time that it might give rise to um, uh, sort of definitional questions about what the family should be. Um, and in fact, often fat questions around family are brought under the dignity clause um, as a result of the absence of, uh, of that in the, in, in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. We have um, a right um, of freedom of occupation and trade. This is not is quite similarly formulated to the German constitutional provision on this. This, uh, this of course, may be regulated by legislation, and so the Bill of Rights makes clear. But again, going back into our history where um, of racial discrimination, where uh, black South Africans were often prevented from practicing trades and occupations. It has, it has historical resonance, and um, the, it has been used quite extensively. I can also say, because I served as a judge on the Namibian court for, for uh, nearly seven years, that it's also a provision in the Namibian constitution and has also been relied on, uh, been used quite a lot in litigation there. We have a provision around labor rights, again, different to the European Convention. Um, they're both individual rights, rights to fair labor practice, uh, rights to form and join trade unions, rights to form employers associations, and collective rights, rights to collective bargaining and a right to strike are all entrenched in the constitution. There's environmental rights, as I've mentioned, and then the economic and social rights, uh, rights to housing, healthcare, food, water, and social security. And I'll come back to those in a moment. Their children's rights, which draw uh, quite extensively on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, the right to a name, the right to nationality, all those kind of provisions that you get in the Convention on the Rights um, on the Convention on the Rights to ch of, of Children. But um, but perhaps the most uh, litigated 
uh, area of children's rights has been the um, the principle that the best interests of a child should take precedence in any case involving children. Tricky conceptually, used a lot, uh, perhaps a slightly difficult provision. I, 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 I mean, I'm happy to debate with you about it, but I think it's, it's a slightly difficult provision. Um, then rights to language and culture, obviously very important in a very multicultural, very multilinguistic uh, society like South Africa. And they include the rights to religious and cultural organizations and to set up religious and um, cultural institutions such as schools, all of it subject to the equality clause or subject to the Bill of Rights generally. So um, religion, the, the, the cultural rights can't be used in a um, overtly discriminatory way. Um, and then finally, access um, to, to information, um, sort of third generation right, I think a very important right in um, democrat democracy supporting, but beyond that as well, and rights to administrative justice, which um, largely entrench uh, widely accepted principles around administrative justice, which is that um, people are entitled to um, fair, reasonable, um, and lawful administrative action by administrators and bureaucrats. Um, but it has been a much litigated provision, and it puts beyond question, for example, that one cannot create ouster clauses that oust the court's jurisdiction over administrative justice. So those are the rights that I think the South African Constitution entrenches in explicit terms, which one way or another one might consider not to be um, explicitly entrenched in the European Convention. And I thought I'd turn just finally to talk a little bit about the um, adjudication of economic and social rights. The, there are two key, well, there, there are really three. So housing um, is a right on its own under Section 26. Then Section 27 entrenches access to healthcare services, um, to food and sufficient food and water and social security. And then there's education. And I haven't mentioned education up till now because um, it is uh, one of the rights that is protected uh, in, in directly at least um, in, the, in the European Convention. But uh, all of these are economic and social rights. And the format under the South African Constitution is that there is a negative duty upon the state not to interfere with economic and social rights. So if you have a house, the constitution says you may not be arbitrarily evicted or deprived of access to the housing. Similarly, if you've got access to schooling, you may not be deprived of it. And that's the negative obligation. And although one sometimes jumps over that straight to the positive obligations, I think that um, the jurisprudence of the court on the negative um, uh, uh, negative duties, particularly in relation to housing and eviction, have been very important. Um, what has become clear there is that you can't just evict somebody from their home without more, uh, which would have been the common law position in South Africa. Very easy to seek eviction as an owner. You just need to say that the person is occupying your land without consent. But given the history of land um, deprivation that I've described, um, and the fact that many people have insecure access to land as a result of the process of uh, dispossession during the colonial apartheid periods, um, access to a, a, a housing has uh, been an important shift in or rebalancing of the interests in relation to land um, under the South African Constitution. And nearly all of that has taken place under the negative obligation not to interfere with right of access to housing. In relation to the positive obligations, in all the economic and social rights other than education, the Constitution delineates the, the extent of the state's obligation as follows. It says, the state must take le reasonable legislative and other measures with its available resources progressively to achieve the realization of this right. And that means that if you don't have a house, you can't simply go to court and say, I want a house. The question will be, whether the state has taken reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to progressively realize your right of access to housing. And so this has really in some ways become an important programmatic set of rights to ensure that the state cannot renege in a sense on provision of access to housing, provision of access to healthcare, sufficient water, food and social security. But it's not a 
right that can be vindicated without more in the hands of a citizen who doesn't have access to housing or social security. And of course, that has led to some criticism by people who would really like to be able to go to court and get a house. Um, and the jurisprudence of the court has been, you know, said it should have been more proactive in, in making that possible. But I think that at the end of the day, given the complex um, policy questions and budgetary questions that are at play in deciding what is a house and where they should be provided, and similarly with regard to health care, um, requiring the state, in a sense, to be able to come to court and say what it's done and why it thinks what it has done is reasonable, is a kind of a shepherding function, perhaps more suited, not in appropriate way of balancing separation of powers with human rights in this area. And I should say that in relation to even civil and political rights, like the right to vote, where a positive obligation is an important part of the right, the court has tended to take a mirrored approach. In other words, has what the state's done to facilitate your right to vote? Is it reasonable? And um, could it, do, could it do better within its available resources? So this approach about um, that, that, that you see in the economic and social rights is really an approach to how to adjudicate positive rights or positive obligations rather than negative obligations. I could perhaps illustrate um, this with just two cases because I think they're quite helpful in giving concrete detail to my explanation. The very first economic and social rights case that the Constitutional Court had to consider uh, was brought by a man called Subramoni, who lived with a chronic renal disease and required dialysis in order to survive. He had expended all his savings on dialysis, and by the time he came to the court, if the public health sector would not provide him with access to dialysis, he would die. He relied on the right of access to health care. The state came along and said, look, we, we understand the tragedy of Mr. Subramoni's position, but we have adopted a policy which relates to access to dialysis machines, which is the following, given that we only have a you know, limited number of dialysis machines, and because once most people go on dialysis machines, they need to stay on them unless there's some change in their condition. We have developed a medico-ethical policy which says that we won't afford the state's dialysis machines to people who are not eligible for a transplant or who will not get better in a short um, time. Because if we were to do so, um, such people would need dialysis for the rest of their lives, and that would prevent other people who might, in fact, only need dialysis for a short time getting access to dialysis. And the Constitutional Court held in a very urgently written decision that although this was a tragic situation, we did not think that the government's approach was unreasonable um, given the scarce resources that are available to the South African healthcare system. And, and so we rejected the claim. And, and tragically and completely expectedly, Mr. Subramani died shortly after the judgment was handed down. The second case to deal with access to healthcare was a case concerning the provision of mother to child of, of um, antiretroviral medication to prevent mother to child transmission of HIV AIDS. Members of the committee may know that South Africa has been particularly um, burdened by um, HIV AIDS. We have one of the highest rates of HIV AIDS in the world. And the risk of HIV AIDS, which tends to be in the sexually active population, people between early adulthood and, um, and middle age, is that um, a, a woman who becomes pregnant with uh, at who is living with HIV is very likely to transmit HIV to her unborn baby in, in utero or during, um, or during um, childbirth. And um, children who, get, who are born with HIV have a very poor prognosis. So in um, the manufacturers of a medication that was um, uh, designed to prevent mother-to-child transmission, came to South Africa in the early 2000s and said, perhaps it was the late 19, 1990s, and said, we will make our medication freely available to you for a, a number of years um, to prevent mother-to-child transmission in South Africa. And the South African government said, well, thank you very much, but we're only going to use it in two clinics in each province, which would be a tiny fraction of the number of clinics, every province having several hundred clinics. And the court was approached by um, a um, 
civil society organization called the Treatment Action Campaign to say that this approach to um, uh, administering nevirapine, which was the medication, to mothers, to pregnant women, um, was not reasonable. And in considering the case, which was a highly politicized case, I have to say, because um, our president and the Minister of Health were were vociferously opposed to the administration of antiretrovirals. Um, um, the court said, given that the, both the World Health Organization considered that nevirapine was the medication of treatment and should be provided to mothers who wished to have it to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV, and the South African Medical Council had um, approved it for mother to, to prevent mother-to-child transmission. We felt that the reasons given by the government were not were not persuasive, and and that therefore the approach the government had adopted was unreasonable. And we struck down the government's policy on um, mother to child transmission and ruled that every clinic should provide um, nevirapine as long as they had the facilities to provide counselling to mothers prior to the administration of nevirapine, and that they um, and that they had the capacity to uh, administer nevirapine. And we also said that if a different drug became available or a different treatment became, became available that was clearly better or more appropriate for preventing mother-to-child transmission, government would be able to adopt that treatment. So those two cases illustrate, I think, the, how the reasonableness test works in relation to positive obligations. Um, they, these cases can be very tragic, but they are, um, they, the reasonableness test provides an important, as it were, constraint or shepherding role in ensuring that government doesn't adopt policies that are under, you know, that do not um, uh, basically recognize people's right of access to health care. And similar approach has been taken in relation to housing, water, um, and as yet we don't have a major case on social security, purely on social security. We've only had a case on social security, which um, had an equality element, in other words, where a particular group of people were being deprived of it, and so there was an equality challenge as well as a social security challenge. So that's been a long monologue on my part. Um, certainly happy to answer any questions that might be um, that might be helpful to you, or to hear any comments that you think um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor O'Regan, um, and that was a, a lengthy overview and, and very interesting and helpful. And your briefing paper, um, the same. I, I want to ask you some questions around you specifically made reference to the fact that the remit um, of this committee in servicing um, what was agreed in 1998 in the Good Friday Agreement in terms of um, a Bill of Rights for the North that would take into um, consideration the particular circumstances and would um, go further than the European Convention on Human Rights. And I suppose now we're in a position where things have changed again. Uh, this committee has set up a, as part of the, the NDNA deal at the start of the year, took into consideration the particular circumstances, but also the fact now that we're in a context of leaving the EU. Um, so not only do we, we have to consider rights that go further, but we're, we're losing uh, rights that are considered are contained in the European Convention. So um, in terms then of the, the rights that you've con uh, spoken about that are supplementary, and the, the equality rights and the, the things that you've listed specifically, how important would you say that they are in terms of a, a post-colonial, post-conflict situation? I know there's striking similarities between yourselves and the situation in South Africa and the situation in, in the North in, in some of the conflict that's happened here and the history that um, ha has, has occurred to, to leave us in the situation that we're in now. Right. Well, just as a point of clarification, I mean, it, it seems to me that um, that Northern Ireland is not necessarily going to leave the Council of Europe, even when you leave the European Union under the Brexit situation. Um, so, but it doesn't mean that you can't completely regulate a Bill of Rights, as 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 do most of the European countries. They have Bills of Rights in their constitution, which do not mirror the European Convention. They have completely different. They they would generally cover most of the things in the European Convention, but they would do them in different ways. And, and I think that's one of the excellent aspects of the European Convention is that it allows reach, you know, local um, bills of rights to flourish and in the light of the particular local concerns. And that's really the second part of your question. Um, I suppose one last thing is that, uh, yeah, so the, the, turning to the second part of your question, there is no doubt that 
in the South African context, the equality clause is absolutely crucial. Um, it's, it's not easy because nobody really knows how to undo a pattern of deep inequality that's arisen as a result of centuries of discrimination. Um, I often say to people, look at the United States. It's, you know, it's uh, 150 years since the end of slavery, and the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, is not really in a position to, have, to tell anybody how to undo the, decade, the, the, the centuries of inequality that are still, um, the legacy is still absolutely apparent, as we know from events the last few weeks, absolutely apparent in, in United States social structure. So the reason I say that is that for a court then, one has to be quite cautious about being very certain about what's necessary to be done to undo inequality when we really have very little idea. And by and large, it's going to be the role of the political arms of government, um, the legislature and the executive, to come up with plans to do that. And courts should be slow to be too judgmental unless it's absolutely clear that what the political arms are wanting to do is in fact going to render inequality more severe or uh, inscribe new patterns of inequality. But it is, it, so it's important, very, it's symbolically very important. I think it's terribly important to, to, the, to the thinking that should inform legislation and the thinking that should inform the executive. Very often when we think about bills of rights, we, really, we think a lot about courts, or maybe that's just the lawyers amongst us because we tend to be a bit sort of solipsistic. But um, Actually, the most important people to be looking at bills of rights are legislatures and executives, and the equality clause is really crucial. But so are the economic and social rights. So often it's been said in South Africa, if we just had civil and political rights, it would in some ways have ignored the reality of the legacy of apartheid and colonialism for most South Africans, which, of course, was the denial of the right to vote in many civil and political rights, freedom of association, etc. But the, the legacy has been poverty, inequality, lack of access to land, lack of access to housing, lack of access to health care. And so in order for the constitution to really address the needs of people on the ground, it needed to acknowledge that these were um, important uh, rights that people had, which government had an obligation to, uh, to seek to fulfill. I mean, I, I, I think the other rights, administrative justice and access to information are also important because they're about the quality of democracy and the relationship between state and citizen. Um, we do, South African constitution talks about um, adopting a democracy to ensure accountability, responsiveness and openness in the state. Those were things that the apartheid state most definitely was not, and colonial states generally were not as well. So the rights of um, administrative justice and access to information are important from a democratic, from the quality of democratic engagement. So I think all of these are important, and I think they would probably be, I, I, I would urge that you look at them closely as, as ways of signaling the kind of state that you want and the way in which the government should work and what you think is important in the light of your history. Thank you for that and I suppose um, in terms of, of when I say when we're leaving the EU in the context of Brexit there have been conversations around the particular and this is this makes up I suppose part of the particular circumstances of the north in that people's citizenship and identity rights and there have been questions and concerns then about how they're going to be protected um, in, in light of Brexit and when we leave the EU the changes that that will um, mean for people. Um, in terms of the progressive realisation in socio-economic rights how successful do you think um, that model has been in delivering rights for people? Well, I suppose that I think it's an important provision. Um, it means that um, it's, it, it recognises the reality in South Africa anyway, that you know, it was not, would not be possible tomorrow or it was not possible on the 28th of April 1994 after the first democratic elections to do everything that we would like to do to protect people's rights. But it also recognised that you come backslide, that you need to be um, constantly proactively seeking to improve the situation rather than backsliding. Backsliding, of course, may become a real issue in the aftermath of COVID-19, given the uh, financial um, circumstances we are enter entering into. Um, and I think 
it's going to be interesting to watch how progressive realization works out in that context. At the very least, it would be that the, the state would have to be able to persuade um, a court, if it was a litigious, if it was a litigious matter, that, um, that that there's been real attention to whether there's alternatives to backsliding, and the within its available resources provision may well become much more. Um, referred to in jurisprudence going forward. It's surprising how little that has been referred to in the current jurisprudence. What, what you're saying there is, is really interesting and the references that you'd made as well to affirmative action, I suppose when you're talking there about um, years and years of discrimination and a, of active um, deliberate lack of investment in particular areas, it, it requires then action to avoid a, a lack of rates as opposed to just letting things sit and no longer um, deliberately discriminating against people. Yeah, and of course Northern Ireland's had a had a series of policies in that regard um, over, over over many years, and 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 quite often been looked at from uh, from here as uh, as an example of how one can go about to undo uh, an an inequality that's sort of entrenched um, in relation to access, to, particularly to employment, uh, but also to educational institutions. Um, that's been an important part of affirmative action policies in South Africa. Yeah, everything that you're saying we, we can still um, see applicable here in the North. Just, I just have one last question and I'll, I'll pass to other members then. Um, you, you've referred um, in the, the, the Bill of Rights, one of the supplementary rights, the protection of um, minorities and of uh, religious and cultural um, freedoms for minority groups. And it's something, I suppose, that when we're having conversations about, you know, cultural expression uh, for minority groups, whether that be um, groups that join us here from other countries or groups w within uh, society in the North, how we can protect their rights without infringing upon others and how we can uh, assure people who who belong to a particular cultural or religious group that their rights to congregate and to practice their cultural expression whatever form that is can can continue yeah i think i think that's right and i i think that um in uh kind of diverse societies these are important provisions so the south african provision section 30 which i've referred to in my briefing says everyone has the right to use the language and to participate in the cultural life of their choice but no one exercising these rights may do so in a manner inconsistent with the provision in the bill of rights and that's often thought to be um, a reference again back to equality uh, and th this is one of the most delicate questions is not only the external relationship in terms of excluding others from within cultural groups, but also gender issues within groups um, is a very delicate uh, a delicate question in, um, in the area of cultural rights. Then there's another provision which says persons belonging to a cultural, religious or linguistic community may not be denied the rights with members of that community to enjoy their culture, practice their religion and use their language and to form, join and maintain cultural, religious and linguistic associations and other organs of civil society. So on the, on the one hand, what is clear here is that we recognize that in our society, and, and, and one of my colleagues often says that we actually, we celebrate diversity. We don't, we're not fearful of it and we don't, we don't try to stamp everybody with the same um, stamp. We want, we want to recognize that there are differences and we celebrate that, but it must be done in a way which does not undermine the other rights in the Bill of Rights and particularly equality. Right, thank you very much. I'll pass now to the Vice Chair, Mike. Chair, thank you very much. And Professor, good afternoon, and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, first of all, given the, the Bill of Rights was a product of the creation of the kind of post-apartheid South Africa, uh, is it possible to protect against racial discrimination, racial exclusion through individual rights only, or do you need to build in communal rights? So we did not formulate, uh, we, we, we have no communal rights as such. Uh, the right to cultural association, which I've just read out, is probably the closest we get to that. But there's a, there's a, um, it, it, there is a recognition in um, the Bill of Rights that very often group membership is, is of significant importance to the individual and to the group. But, but the focus in our Bill of Rights is, is individuals. Nevertheless, if you look at 
uh, so I've read you Section 31, but if you look at Section 9.2, which is the provision which deals with affirmative action, it says, um, to promote the achievement of equality, legislative measures designed to protect or advance persons or categories of persons disadvantaged by discrimination may be taken. So it recognizes that affirmative action is directed at particular categories of person, but that is really to, um, in some ways, the closest we get to a recognition that um, group identity warrants special treatment. I suppose that's really how you'd formulate it. It's not so much that it creates a right to affirmative action in a group, but it creates a recognition that there is um, there's um, a special treatment um, needs to be given to groups to ensure that individuals' rights to equality is, are properly protected. You, you said the courts must consider international law, including international law that has not been ratified in South Africa. That sounds like a strange concept to me. Uh, that sounds a bit strange. So we have two, two provisions which relate to international law and the interpretation of international law. Later on in the Constitution, where we're dealing with uh, international law, so it regulates um, the process for ratification um, and allocates responsibilities and, um, uh, between the legislature and the executive. It also says that uh, legislation in South Africa must be interpreted, if possible, in a manner that is consistent with South Africa's with international law. Now, that provision is generally understood to apply to South Africa's international law obligations, and that's in a sense the idea that when South Africa undertakes international obligations on the international sphere, it will, uh, as a matter of good faith, seek to ensure that its legislation is compatible with obligations it's taken at the international sphere. The, the Bill of Rights provision, in some ways, you're right, it is strange because international law there is read large, and that's been how the court has approached it. But then, in a sense, the implications of that are reduced by the recognition that consider only means take into account. And the truth is that there's often quite a lot of helpful guidance to be got from international. It's not so much only international law writ international obligations, con conventional obligations, but also the decisions of treaty bodies on the interpretation of treaties, um, uh, declarations on particular aspects of, um, of, of human rights. And although they are not binding on the court or by any means considered to be binding, they, they can be useful to look at to give you some sense of what, what a right really um, should be understood to be. So I think that um, it would be very different if it said in interpreting the Bill of Rights, courts shall give effect to, to um, treaty obligations. That would be a different thing. And then the court would have definitely said it's only our treaty obligations. And, and that is one of the ways to go. But there's, a, there's questions about what is the relationship between treaty body interpretations of, say, the International Covenant and Civil Political Rights and a domestic court's interpretation of its own Bill of Rights ostensibly protecting the same right, but potentially with a whole different historical context, which may mean that you actually want to adopt a slightly different interpretation than the treaty body. And in South Africa, there's no doubt that courts do that. It's quite common for the courts to take a different view to the interpretation of a right that's protected in an international human rights convention, but also in the South African Bill of Rights. The South African courts take a different understanding or interpretation of the, of the clause in the domestic provision, the, nearly always because of the context and you know the circumstances. So the courts are completely able to do that. There's no obligation upon them to give effect to interpretations adopted by international treaty bodies. Thank you. Um, third question is, is about progressive realization. If we look at section 26 housing, which is about everybody having the, the right to access to adequate housing, is adequate defined? No. Um, and, and so what the, arguably the most lively jurisprudential debate that arises around this arises around the concept of minimum core. And it comes back to the answer to your previous question. The South African court has taken the view that in the first place, it is for the state to determine what the minimum core of a right is. So the state must decide what it considers to be adequate housing. And in fact, there have been lively political conversations in South Africa about should the state be focusing on providing brick housing to people, 
uh, in which case, by definition, they're going to be able to provide fewer houses, or should the state be focusing on providing site and service where people could erect their own homes? And these are political discussions, and I think the court's view has been that that's an appropriate place for that political discussion to take place. If the political discussion, you know, produces an outcome which the court thinks is clearly unreasonable, then that could be the court might well say, well, look, your minimum core here is just not reasonable. But it's the court takes the view that in the first place, it's for the state to decide what in its program it is going to seek to do. And then it is open for people to challenge that if they wish. It's it's difficult in every area of positive obligations. It, it, not housing, it arises, but also social security, food, water, health care, um, these are all difficult questions to decide. What is the minimum content of the right that we think the state is going to provide? Um, and the, and so largely the court works off what the what the state has undertaken. And so take education. The state says we're going to provide nine years of compulsory state-funded education to South Africans. And so, so far the challenge has not been that that's an inadequate amount of education. It's been that, you know, you're not doing it properly and your system, you know, schooling, the quality of schools is not good enough and you haven't allocated enough teachers and so on. Those are the kind of cases that arrive, not to the notion of nine years of uh, basic education. So, so finally, just to clarify on that, you, you've made clear that the Constitutional Court can strike down government policy, for example, on, on HIV with a mother and a child and a baby. Are there any examples where the court has had to interfere in terms of budget allocations by the government, say between the money they're giving to education versus housing, and on the programme for government itself? No. So in that regard, we're different to the Colombian. If you're interested in this area, which you know is a fascinating area, the Colombian um, court, constitutional court, has been much more uh, direct in that regard. Um, but the South African court doesn't hasn't done that. And generally, we haven't had challenges that directly raise budgetary allocations. I'm not saying that they wouldn't arise along the way. Um, but it's actually very interesting that we've had relatively few cases in which the state has raised as a defense that they haven't done what the applicants want them to do because they don't have available resources. Um, most of the challenges I mean, a lot of our challenges are really around a not well-functioning civil service, which is the reality in, you know, in, in large parts of the um, delivery in the delivery areas of South Africa. So particularly education is a, is a particular problem. But we haven't had a direct challenge which says you should have allocated more funds to housing or education, not directly. Um, there has been a very interesting programmatic series of challenges to norms and standards in education, saying to government, you must set the norms and standards. So that's a little bit like what is educative housing? What do you think the norms and standards of education are? And government kept sort of um, saying, we're going to publish them, we're going to publish them, but eventually we're put on terms by a court. And they did publish them. And then the, um, the civil society organizations are now monitoring compliance with those norms and standards. That's the programmatic focus of the South African experience here, rather than what you'll see in Colombia, which is... Um, a much more um, sort of firmer uh, referral back to government. We don't like your national budget. Very helpful. Professor, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. No bother. Um, Michelle, do you have questions? Yes, thank you. Um, although most of it has been addressed, thank you very much for your very comprehensive presentation. Um, you did say that South Africa obviously remains a, a very complicated place uh, and that generally the text of the Bill of Rights has been a success and any criticism that has come um, is really in relation to an inability to address the legacy of the past. In your opinion, how could this have been achieved? Gosh, I wish I had a wand. Um, but, I mean, I think the reality about changing societies which have got um, deeply deep patterns of inequality is it's a long-term project for, for government, legislature and the executive in the first place, and, and then every sphere of government, so national, provincial, and local in our case. And it's also, um, it requires an iterative process of assessing what's working. So I think a lot of data collection, what's working, what's not working, what are the causes of the persistence of the problems, this is it's 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 hard it's hard work, frankly, 
And courts are not going to provide any enormous simple solution to what effectively is going to be a long collaborative uh, process of trying to build a fairer society. They can provide um, a window onto the process so it becomes less inaccessible to ordinary members of the public in between elections. But there's no shortcut to the hard work that needs to be done. Thank you. Something may be more complicated. <laughs> um, who do we have? We've got Paula who indicated first if Paula is still on the is she still there? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, that was an excellent presentation. My question, you, you mentioned that um, there was a strong equality clause running through it and you read out the preamble, which I thought was absolutely excellent. So really my question would be, in, in a situation where you would have a disputed um, narrative of the past and you said you know it was agreed through negotiation and I think discussion, so you're going back 25 years, was it really that easy at the time to come up with the wording for the preamble? Well, that's a very interesting question, actually. But, you know, and I, I think you may be going to be hearing from my good colleague, Alvin Sachs, at some stage, who will talk to these issues really very movingly, I have no doubt. But, but one of the distinctive features about the South African transition was, you know, um, the political leaders, Nelson Mandela and the liberation movements were unbanned and released from prison in, in February 1990. It took us really four years to get the first draft of the constitution and another two and a half years after that. And during that process, there was a long process of talking and trying to find a way forward. There's no doubt in my mind that in terms of our disputed historical narrative, if the great contribution of the TRC, our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was to take some of that out of the picture, it, nobody could really dispute that the apartheid state had been involved in gross human rights violations after the TRC was finished. Um, and so that was quite helpful because I think by and large, most South Africans buy into the fact that we do need to have a more, I mean, there'll always be people who you know don't turn on, but I would say that the solid majority of South Africans of every um, racial background would agree that then much work needs to be done to build a more just society. Our biggest problems are, I think, that it's how to get there and how to get there in a time when our economy is not growing particularly well in a time of, and of course COVID is going to make that much, much harder. And I think one of the things which I had not fully expected 25 years ago was where we have a relatively a weak state, um, and so delivering things is quite difficult. There's, we, we spend more money per child uh, in education than any other middle-income country. We have the worst outcomes. And why is that? that? Those things are the things that are hard to change. Um, but the, the idea that we need to change that is not disputed in South Africa. The disputes come really over things like um, where there are scarce resources and you need to, so for example, give you an example, it's just arisen in the COVID-19 saga. And I, I could see this being the sort of thing that would cause controversy in, in Northern Ireland if you just change the facts slightly. Government decided that it would create a, a pool of money for small businesses to, um, to access, to help them through the COVID-19 saga. Access to those benefits is done on a kind of a point or model and you get points for different things and it's the nature of your business, the circumstances you're in. One set of the points is on the extent to which you have got good um, black representation either in ownership or in um, employment in, in your company, what we call double B, triple E, so broad-based uh, black economic empowerment, triple B, double E, uh, broad-based black economic empowerment schedule. That's, it's only one of the factors, but nevertheless, it is a factor, and you're going to get more points. And, and that that was challenged before the courts on the basis that it really race should not be an issue in relation to COVID-19. The response of the court was, well, look, you know, this is a policy decision. We have the overall trajectory is we still have deep inequality running along racial lines, and it's not inappropriate for the government to take this as one of the factors, not the determinative necessarily or governing or major factor, but one of the factors. So that's how these sorts of things turn up in our modern conversation. It's not 
oh, the past was actually just or whatever. It's we all accept that, in fact, there is inequality, but it's how do we get from here to less inequality? And, of course, the anxiety of white South Africans, particularly white South Africans who are feeling uh, themselves threatened by poverty, is that the state is going to favour black South Africans and not them. So that's the that's that's where the shoe pinches. And there's no, I don't think there's a complete solution to that other than keeping, I think, a, a relatively kind of steady head about the fact that it's not easy to undo this, and we all have to acknowledge that. Um, and to continue to make clear that, you know, you do, you're not actually wanting to, you know, it's not a, it's our turnism approach. It's, it is an approach of recognizing, you know, that everybody has a right to be in the society and be part of the society, and we, we recognize that. But in undoing the past, sometimes um, we are going to look at certain things which are part of the legacy of the past, which uh, and, and give benefits. That's the whole affirmative action debate. Okay, thank you. And another very quick question, it was really about the communal form of rights you've mentioned there in terms of like trade unions. And how easy has that been to, for them to demonstrate their standing really in the courts and for them really to advance um, you know, cases? Well, we have almost no cases that I can I think of where we have where people have tripped up on standing. We have a general, we have a gen, uh, generous standing provision expressly in the Bill of Rights, Section 38. I warmly recommend it. I, I think generally fears about uh, inappropriate standing are, are vastly overrated in, in the uh, legal literature. Much better to let people get to court. And because there is something very democratic about people giving access to courts to complain about, most people don't go to court because they they've not they got some sort of silly grievance. It's often something that's very deep-seated. And the ability to be able to complain about and get somebody to listen to them seriously, even if they don't succeed, is often really important. So we don't, we don't trip people up on standing. I genuinely and we're a pretty litigious society all sorts of people bring cases to courts um but i genuinely think it's the right way if you if you're wanting to um give people a sense that they have a stake they can be heard and not only through their right to vote but also in courts over issues that really matter to them that and the other thing i didn't mention was costs i would think seriously about your regulating costs in bill of rights cases because you don't want to milk people in costs when they brought a genuine case about which they care, even if they lose, they shouldn't be having to, you know, be paying dramatic cost bills. And so we, we did that very early on, not actually in the Bill of Rights. It was a ruling the court made. And again, I think that's been a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you for all that, Jesse. Yep. Um, John has indicated. I'm with the audio, so I don't know if you can hear me or not, can you? We can. Yeah. John, yeah, sorry. Uh, a very interesting presentation um, <clears throat> covering a wide range of the issues that the committee has been looking at over this last period of time. Um, just, just on your last point there, um, Kate, in relation to accessibility to the courts, it's one thing having rights, it's one thing having a Bill of Rights, but how accessible are the courts in South Africa to uh, the ordinary man and woman? Because uh, you did costs can prevent people from uh, ensuring their rights are enforced? It's a very good question. I mean, uh, you know, and, and uh, I've split my life now between Cape Town and Oxford. I'm conscious of the situation with legal aid in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, we don't have an effective system of civil legal aid at all. Um, we are very fortunate to have a, a wide array of the highly expert uh, civil society uh, um, public interest firms, law firms that represent people, some of them specialized, some of them general. And if you look through the jurisprudence or, or you know, list of a uh, hundred cases of the South African Constitutional Court, a significant portion of them are bought by those organizations, either representing amici or the applicants. So um, we, the, the, I absolutely agree with you that access to justice is probably the Issue we are not looking at enough seriously, seriously enough in most democracies. It's certainly an issue in South Africa. Legal fees are a big issue and working out how to make courts accessible is important. And that's partly the costs point, as you, as you rightly note, uh, relates to that. So there's, there's access to lawyers to take your cases and, and thinking about that and thinking about access to justice seems to me to be a very important part if you really want your Bill of Rights to 
to make a difference. Another aspect of this, though, is what you might describe as legal literacy, which is ordinary people understanding what their rights are and what the mechanisms are for enforcing the rights. And again, you know, one doesn't necessarily, I mean, it, it's not impossible to think of the use of tribunals and more user-friendly, less legalistic type of institutions to deal with some aspects of rights. Um, so, for example, under our Equality Act, we have got equality courts, which are really tribunals there in every small town attached to our lower level courts, magistrates courts. And, you know, if you want to go in because a hairdresser has told you that they won't dress black hair or you want to go in because a and b has said we don't allow gay people here or whatever the complaint is, you can go and represent yourself and get that dealt with at a relatively low level. And very few of those, um, I mean, I'm, I am conscious of the um, wedding cake cases that come from your jurisdiction, but um, um, very few of those actually do end up in the higher courts. So there are simple ways for people just to be able to go and, 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 you know, whether they succeed or not, they can go and take the case. But it's underutilized, and I think that's because of legal literacy. People don't really know their rights, and I think thinking about how how to communicate to people that, you're, you know, this is these are your rights is a very important part of um, introducing a new Bill of Rights. Thank you. Um, in terms of a society coming out of conflict, um, we, we are still coming out of conflict. And I suspect that's similar to a case in South Africa and other places which have seen uh, long periods of, of, of conflict. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and you quite rightly use the American example, um, 150 years after slavery, 50 years after the civil rights uh, legislation, there's still serious inequalities and divisions in that society. But how important has been the Bill of Rights uh, in the South African example of building a new society? And I just, I just add this point as well, because uh, it, it goes back to the minorities. Uh, we, we're a society which is changing demographically. Um, and uh, it, within the next decade, uh, we will see uh, a significant demographic change in our society. So those who used to be the majority will become the minority. How important in South Africa has the Bill of Rights been protecting, this may seem a strange question, but protecting those who were once the, the, in power, uh, the whites, who are now protecting them as a minority, who are largely, uh, as a group, out of power? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no doubt that in the genesis of our Bill of Rights and the genesis of our constitutional framework, uh, anxiety, that, those considerations were key. So the, the apartheid government, the National Party government uh, in the late 1980s suddenly began to realize in the early 1990s that if we were going to um, move to a democratic society and there was going to be um, a kind of transformation to, to a new way of doing things, then a Bill of Rights might be an important way of protecting rights. And I, I, I do think that that was seen by the National Party. So when the Bill of Rights was negotiated, in fact, there was relatively little controversy. The controversies were over really small things like whether we should have a right to lockout and the, should we have a Bill of Rights? The liberation movement thought we should have a Bill of Rights, and so did the and so did the National Party apartheid government, and and part of that was a recognition that this will create an uh, a, a kind of understanding of the kind of society we're going to and a system of protection uh, through independent courts. So, yes, I think the genesis definitely lay rooted in that, and. I, I still think, although, as I say, the, there will be times when people disagree with the court's decisions on some aspects here or there, generally you do find people taking cases to court from all walks of South African life across the political spectrum, and we have a wide political spectrum. Nearly all of them will take cases to courts. Well, you don't take cases to court if you think it's, it's going to fail and you think you're going to get complete injustice and nobody's going to listen to you because they're prejudiced and biased. You, you take them because you think that there's a chance that you win. You take them for a range of reasons, for political reasons and public, you know, to raise a public issue, but also generally because you believe in the project. And I think that remains the case today. Um, so, um, and we have got, uh, you know, uh, civil society organizations which would be perceived as very much concerned about the interests of Afrikaners, white Afrikaners, and civil society organizations which would be black consciousness and and all of them litigate before the court all the time. Um, 
So I think that uh, I think that's um, that's a sign that a bit of rights does do that, and I think that it creates a an alternative way of having a conversation about what sort of society you want to be and airing the issues of that. It's not going to solve all the problems of the conflict, but at the end of the day, if democracy is about conflict by other means. It seems to me that courts and bills of rights are an important part of those other means for conflict, which are fall short of um, violence, which, you know, in both your society and, and mine have been deeply marred by. And there's no doubt that courts can give, um, give a, a, a forum, create a forum for those other forms of conflict. OK, thank you very much. Mark is... Mark, still. Mark, do you have any questions that you want to ask? No, no, no. Thanks, Chair. Just supposed to say thank you for the presentation. It was very comprehensive, as others have said, but also quite fascinating. To be honest, uh, the, the couple of questions that I had in mind were touched on by both Mike and uh, and John there, but the, the answers more than covered any queries that I did have. But thank you again. Brilliant. Well, Kate, I think everyone ha has said mm -hmm. that your your presentation was uh, worth was uh, worthy and, and very uh, interesting. And uh, thank you for your time this afternoon and for joining us um, and answering all our questions. So, thank you. Very happy. Thank you. I will wish you all well with the really important work you're doing, and we'll, 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 I'll watch it with great interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So. Members, um, we'll now move on to the third item in our agenda. So we have a briefing from, and I can see Kula has joined us. So we have a, a briefing on uh, children's rights by the Commissioner for Children and Young People. And um, Kula is going to be joined by the Chief Executive, um, Maria. Is, is Maria on? Yep. So we, we've got you both. So the clerk's memo along with uh, the Commissioner's written submission, can be found... There's something wrong. Maybe Maureen? Who's got the didgeridoo? <laughs> Maureen, maybe a speaker phone or a speaker on or something? Maureen, have you got a speaker on or something? No, I think that should be OK. Uh, your grand now. Maybe, maybe just right. a wee bit of interference or something. So. Um, we've, we've got the um, written submission uh, between pages 66 and 95 of the pack and uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, paper is also included. So I'd like to welcome uh, Kula Yusuma, uh, the Commissioner for Young People, and Maureen McCafferty, the, the Chief Executive at NICI, uh, to the meeting. And uh, thank you both for your time this afternoon and if you want to begin your briefing. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. I'm going to... Um, just have a few opening remarks. I'm not going to take any more than 10 minutes, but just to set the context. And then, of course, both Mairead and I would be very, very happy to take questions and get into a discussion. A um, little bit daunting coming after uh, Kate, but w w um, I'll do my best. So at first, I want to thank the committee for giving us the opportunity to present to you this afternoon and really welcome the discussion on a child's right compliant Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. So, as, as you've said, Chair, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is celebrated as the most complete statement on children's rights ever produced, containing civil, political, socio-economic and cultural rights, and it is the most widely ratified international human rights treaty in history. The UK government signed the UNCRC in 1990 and ratified it a year later. I am obliged um, by the Commissioner for Children and Young People Order 2003 to have regard to the relevant provisions of the Convention when determining whether and how to exercise the functions of NICI. Of NICI. It's therefore challenging and often frustration that, frustrating that the relevant authorities that we are advising and monitoring do not have the same obligation. And a Bill of Rights that includes the UNCRC would address this. The Committee on the Rights of the Child, who oversee the Convention, has highlighted incorporation of the CRC into domestic legislation as a key means of implementation. Each time the Committee has examined the UK on, on its implementation of the Convention, it has expressed concern that it has not yet been incorporated. 
The concluding observations uh, of 2016 linked the incorporation of the CRC to the Bill of Rights here in Northern Ireland when it recommended to the UK that it should expedite the enactment of a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland agreed under the Good Friday Agreement. You will have seen from our written evidence paper that we have outlined the different ways that the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland influence every aspect of the lives of children and young people today. When children, while children and young people have, have been born and grown up in a time of relative peace and stability, and the impact of the troubles is still very heavily felt by them. Segregation and community division continue to impact on the daily life of many. Every summer we can feel the tensions rising as children and young people often get caught up in civil unrest and become needlessly criminalised. There is evidence that the high levels of persistent child poverty, mental ill health, educational and health inequalities exist in the areas that suffered most as a result of the conflict. Add to that the continued impact of armed and para paramilitary style gangs who traumatise and abuse young people and their families through criminal coercion, exploitation and assault, then it is clear that children and young people's life, life chances and rights are deeply affected by living in communities who continue to feel the effect of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. This has been echoed in the Fresh Start panel report on addressing paramilitary ac activity, where they clearly identified the need the need to address systematic societal issues in the areas of, of economic deprivation, segregated housing and education. It recognises that the troubles are deeply embedded in Northern Ireland society and it is impossible to differentiate between disadvantage, breach of rights and the impact of the conflict and makes recommendations accordingly, all of which have been accept, accepted by the executive. A Bill of Rights provides an opportunity to recognise the unique circumstances of children and young people here, most notably as a result of the conflict, and to put in place a framework of rights to address this. As has already been discussed, we know that the committee is tasked to consider the implications of the UK exiting the EU when developing its proposals. While there have been many developments in the Brexit process, the concerns of young people remain highly relevant and have yet to be allayed. The committee will be aware that along with our counterparts in the Republic, we have worked with young people to articulate their concerns regarding Brexit. Sorry, where was I? And there are a range of issues um, particular to children, specifically that there can be no difference to the rights, opportunities and benefits enjoyed by young people who identify as Irish compared to those who identify solely as British, as is their right under the Good Friday Agreement. It is imperative, therefore, that the Assembly take the opportunity afforded by the Bill of Rights to protect children and young people from the negative effects of Brexit, including the changes on rights based on culture, cultural and national identity. The advent of the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the necessity to have robust child's rights protection mechanisms in place. As we emerge from what may be just the first phase of this pandemic, we are gaining a better understanding of the negative experiences of young people and existing inequalities are simply becoming more exacerbated in many cases. And there are a number of issues to be considered. And just briefly on the issues, they are um, uh, the rights to services for families and children with a disability who've expressed feelings of, fee of being abandoned by the state the impact on a child's rights to education and the inconsistencies in the equality and support received by children. Whilst there has been a recognition that there may be a surge in referrals to mental health services, we also have to be concerned that this, will, this may well be the case for child, for child protection referrals. And then the continuing use of emergency measures to, to dilute existing legal protections without clear evidence of the need or likely impact uh, is concerning. For example, the use of best endeavours to replace compliance with a child's statement of special educational need needs to be addressed urgently. Just moving on to what's going on elsewhere, the committee's already heard from Professor Hoffman about developments in, in GB, notably the rights of children and young persons measure in Wales. It is also the explicit in intention of the Scottish Government to incorporate the UN Convention into domestic legislation and they plan to be doing it during this session of their parliament. So in view of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland and the added challenges our children face, it's incongruous that there is a potential that they may have fewer protections than their peers in Scotland, Wales, as well as the Republic of Ireland. 
The passing of the Children's Sur Services Cooperation Act by the Assembly in 2015 was a sig significant and welcome legislative development, but it is only the start. The obligations under the Act should inform all the work of government departments and agencies, compelling them to cooperate in order to improve the lives of children and young people, and places a statutory obligation on government to, to adopt a children and young person strategy. But a national action plan and, a co and coordination are just two of the several measures that the Committee on the Rights of the Child believes are necessary to ensure the mainstreaming and full implementation of children's rights. Others include the child's rights impact assessment, data collection and indicators, child budgeting, training and cooperation, and the provision of an independent human rights institution specifically tasked to monitor the impl implementation of the UNCLC. I'll leave it to the committee to decide how effective that institution is in Northern Ireland. So moving on, the Bill of Rights, as, as you've already discussed with Kay, is intended to complement the protections outlined in the ECHR and incorporated in turn in the Human Rights Act. Whilst it does of course apply to children and young people, the ECHR does not have specific provision for children, except in the protocol and education, and even then it talks about persons. Relying on case law to fully test the ECHR's application to children and young people is expensive and cumbersome and places a, a burden on our, most, uh, on our youngest and most vulnerable members of the community. Therefore, when this committee is considering rights supplementary to those outlined in the ECHR, it must make provisions for the UNCRC, ensuring that children's rights are more explicit than they currently are. But the real question has to be, will inclusion of the UNCRC into a Bill of Rights make a difference to the lives of children? Will it ensure that we give our children the best start in life? And if it doesn't, then there's no point. It's just another example of paying lip service to how important our children are here. Incorporating the UNCRC into domestic law will, or, or through the Bill of Rights will make it a key tool to improve outcomes for all children and young people in Northern Ireland. Its main value is not in the possibility of strategic litig litigation, but in the message it conveys about the status of children and the way it will embed their rights into practice, policy and legislation. It will no longer be an afterthought, but central to everything that we do and makes explicit the frameworks that government must use to inform its work and from which only positive outcomes will in there, never to be ensue. Incorporation will not, make reason, will not make unreasonable demands on the public purse, and you've already discussed this earlier. And Article 4 of the Convention reminds, reminds states of the necessity to undertake all appropriate administrative, legislative and other measures to the maximum extent of their available resources. The Committee on the Rights of the Child reminds governments that they have to understand how their spending decisions impact on the lives of children and young people, and that the government is confident that it's achieving the best outcomes for every pound, shilling and pence in old money is spent. Nikki has a suite of resources on child budgeting, which it can make available, we can make available to the committee should that be of assistance. So, 26 years on from the ceasefires and 22 years after the Belfast uh, Good Friday Agreement, and despite not having lived through the conflict, the impact of the troubles in Northern Ireland is still very heavily felt by our children and young people. Segregation, community division, socioeconomic deprivation and trauma continue to be a daily part, a daily part of life for many of them. There has been insufficient focus in the peace process to date on the impact of the conflict on our children. Once it is accepted that, in, that the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland impact the lives of every child here, then it is logical to conclude that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, with its established and internationally recognised status, should be the standard that the Bill of Rights sets for all our children. Similarly, regardless of the support or not for Brexit, it has to be accepted that there is a risk of diminution of rights between the North and South and those who identify as Irish and British. Here is, there is an opportunity in the Bill of Rights to address these inequalities. And finally, just want to say that in my role as Commissioner for Children and Young People, I have the privilege of talking to children of all ages and telling them about their rights and hearing about their worries as well. But when speaking about their rights to younger children, I describe the UNCRC as a set of promises that our government has made to them. Incorporating the UNCRC will demonstrate to our children that their government intends to keep that promise. Thank you, and we're looking forward to having the discussion with you. Thank you, uh, Kayla, for your briefing and for your submission. Um,
I suppose I want to start off, you referred there that you're watching the earlier briefing, so I don't know if yeah. you've caught all the questions, but um, when when we're talking about the specific remit of a, a Bill of Rights in the North, and we refer to the particular circumstances of the North and then the impact, the impact here of, of Brexit, and you've referred there to the impact of both of those things uh, on children and young people here and how they're already um, at a loss. And we've had yeah. presentations from Professor Hoffman and from yeah. uh, Professor Tobias Lack about what other uh, jurisdictions are doing in terms of how they're getting around implementing uh, the CNC. So how much urgency do you think um, Brexit adds to a, a need for, for implementing children's rights in, in, a, in a Bill of Rights here? It was urgent in 2006. It, we're not almost, particularly if we if we go with no deal at the end of the year, it's we are at crisis now. The protocol for Northern Ireland um, was was helpful, but it didn't necessarily address all the issues. So we have to make up for the the challenges in in the Brexit Brexit deal. We have to take it in our own hands. So this is we're in an emergency situation now, um, uh, looking at now that we're in the last six months of uh, post-transition or as we go into transition. So, no, it is urgent. Um, the Bill of Rights, uh, you know, the, the, the Bill of Rights was a reassuring thing when we when we looked at it in 1998. And it made it, it, it gave it gave me hope when I saw it in the new deal, new decade, um, new approach deal. Um, and that is now urgent. Um, our, COVID has, has shone a spotlight on where our children are most disadvantaged, particularly those living in poverty, particularly uh, and, and those um, with disabilities and special educational needs. We now know how difficult it is for those children, those families to get some of their most basic needs met, including their right to education. So we're, we, we are in an urgent, in an urgent place. Um, when when you talk about the impact of the conflict on the generations since so you had referred to the fact that we're 22 years post Good Friday Agreement, 26 years post uh, first ceasefire, um, and there's still an impact um, on that generation. Yeah. And yeah. I, mean, I myself was yeah. born in the very last days of 1991, um, so I can sort of attest to growing up in, in that post-conflict um, situation, but still very much feeling the impact of segregation and yeah. all of the things that, that you have outlined. And you can see how uh, those effects are greater in areas that were the worst impacted by the conflict. How then do you think that's going to be exacerbated as we move forward if we lose and, and it looks like we're likely to lose the, the rights that we currently have within the European Charter, Charter of Fundamental Rights. Right. And we don't have something to, to, to act as a stopgap. I think that I think that's the point, um, Emma. Um, I think the point is our ch we've we've had a whole generation of children born and age out since since the Good Friday Agreement, including including my own daughter. Um, and so the we need to look at the and the Good Friday Agreement guarantees a parity of the steam of rights between North and South. Um, let alone, uh, so so whatever is lost through um, losing the European Charter of Fundamental Rights has to be addressed through the Bill of Rights. And there is in Article 24 a broad range um, of rights for children under, under the, the Fundamental Charter. And of course, an incorporation of the UNCRC lock, stock and barrel into the Bill of Rights will, will go some way to addressing that. But also um, it, it needs to address the challenges of um, uh, the, diff the, the possibilities of different rights enjoyed by children and young people who, who hold an Irish passport and those who have every right to identify as British and hold a British passport. We are going to see different challenges and, and, and that those two groups of children enjoying enjoying different rights and that is not fair and that that runs the risk of creating greater divisions than we already have of course and, and we don't want to see that um, no. thank you um i'll pass now to the vice chair mick chair thank you very much kula hi i'm Reid. good afternoon um kula would it be reasonable to say that in terms of particular circumstances 
These are all defined through the kind of post-conflict legacy. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I, I suppose it, in a nutshell, uh, when I think of particular, when you think of particular circumstances, and certainly when you look at the, 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 those positions, provisions in the Good Friday, you, that's you think about what is unique about Northern Ireland, and there are many, many th things that are unique and indeed joyous about Northern Ireland, which is why I, I chose to live here. But you immediately think about the particular outworkings of the legacy uh, of the conflict which includes our divisions but also the trauma um, that people um, across Northern Ireland have experienced so that's how I interpret and, and I think you know and Nikki interprets the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Great thank you. Uh, you mentioned Stephen Agnew's private members bill on children's cooperation but you describe it as the starting point yeah. so what, what's the next step what what's what would a Bill of Rights do that the PMB hasn't done? So the the um, the Children's Service Cooperation Act, what it does, and, and we're yet to see it in its full glory, um, but what it does, it allows for cooperation against eight, eight outcomes in, um, and, and requires government to cooperate to deliver on those eight outcomes, all of which are rights compliant and, they, and people have to take account of the UNCRC, but it only allows for cooperation and it only allows for a national action plan. It doesn't enshrine in law all, all 42 rights that are outlined in the UNCRC. It doesn't allow for mechanisms such as a child's rights impact assessment, such as children's budgeting, or, um, it, although it does allow for pooling of resources, um, such as a mandatory training for everybody who, who delivers a service to children and young people. Please don't underestimate uh, the, the possible impact of um, the CSCA, but it, it it is the beginning of something. It's not the end of something. It doesn't deliver what has to be delivered, which is it, um, protecting every right children have. Um, it, it, so that it is um, legal. It's a government and their agencies are legally obliged to deliver on those. Okay. And finally, I mean, you, you're obviously concerned about the impact of Brexit. And yeah. um, I, I share concerns uh, about that. But what, what, sort of more specifically, is it? The fact we wouldn't have the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and what does that remove that is currently there? I'm going to I'm going to move on to our Brexit expert, Mairead, to answer that question, um, and um, and then I'll take I'll take other questions. Okay. Over to you, Mairead. Uh, um, I was enjoying sitting back there. Um, <laughs> So, well, I mean, Article 24 in terms of the Charter, obviously, it protects children's rights. It talks about best interests. It talks about, um, obviously, Article 3 and the UN Convention talks about the best interests being applied. The issue, the, sorry, um, the issue with um, wanting to have incorporation of the UN Convention, Mike, is very much as Kul has already outlined. It's about a comprehensive incorporation of all of the civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights that we all say we want to see for our children and young people. So it's very important because we know that the Charter has already been set aside. The Westminster government's already done that. The prospect, as Em has already said earlier on, of a no deal scenario come the 31st of December and hitting the 1st of January with no deal doesn't bear thinking about. I mean, I think people have concerns about Brexit fundamentally already, and particularly in terms of the protection of rights when we also look at children and the impact that it'll have on them in terms of the, you know, the land border, in terms of rising levels of child poverty, we're concerned about traffic of children through and to Northern Ireland as well, and also all of the other issues to do with security and protection and safeguarding. So what we're actually calling for and calling for incorporation of the UN Convention into the Bill of Rights is the comprehensive protections that we all say, as I say, we want to see. Um, one of the big issues for us, and we heard this from the young people ourselves when we were doing the work with them north and south, they know and they appreciate that we do live in a society with segregated communities. We do live in a society that is contested in part as well still all these years after, you know, relative peace has been established. But we st do still live with the legacy of the conflict. And we are living and we are hearing from our children and young people. 
certainly before COVID in relation to their own communities, about the segregation that they face, about the fear that they face as well because of ex-paramilitary gangs and the fact that they feel they can't actually associate with each other. So what we're actually looking at, you know, is, OK, we know the charter has been set aside. So in a sense that that ship has sailed. What we're also looking at now, though, is how do we make a Bill of Rights robust and that actually comprehensively protects our children and young people going forward? Because if we are saying there's a commitment to no diminution of rights, then this is one fundamental way we can do it for our children and young people. OK, if, if you got your way, Mairead, I mean, currently you have a statutory duty to advise the executive on the adequacy and effectiveness of law Absolutely. and services Absolutely. with regard to children. Yeah. If you got your way in terms of a Bill of Rights, is there not a danger you'd be running off to the courts rather than a I... storm and pass? <laughs> No, 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 no. I, th I think that's always the fear and that that's always a, an issue that's raised when any kind of legislation is passed, you know, and, you know, history has shown that the floodgates don't open, you know, having legislation and the purpose of legislation a lot of the time, and I think Professor Reagan um, alluded to this earlier, it's actually about what you do as a society, having legislation as a basis to establish the culture, the values and the kind of society you want to live in and you want to create is why we have legislation. That does not necessarily mean floodgates would be open. And certainly, and I'm sure Kilo would be the first to say this, we certainly wouldn't have the resources to be able to run to the courts every five minutes. Um, what it would do and what it does do when you have legislation is make people think twice before they would breach any rights in relation to those children and young people who are already having their rights compromised. Thank you. Can I, can, sorry, Mike, can I just also very quickly respond by saying um, I think it removes, it may also remove um, the need to go to court if you're in, if, if protecting children's rights is in that must do column. Um, uh, it, but it, it does have it does have you know that that threat there. But I th I think it removes and I think it makes it makes our job a lot easier um, around the conversations that are had. So um, yeah, I don't I don't think we'll all be in and out of the courts every day. Okay, thank you both very much. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Mike. Um, <clears throat> we'll go then to the teleconference and. And Paula has indicated that she has a question. Yep, she is. Paula, can't, can't hear you. <laughs> oh. Sorry, sorry. Um, my first, so good to see us today, ladies. Um, the, sec, uh, the question really is around the stuff around COVID-19. Yeah. Totally agree around education, safeguarding children with disability. Um, I'm just wondering how you think that if we had children's rights fundamentally embedded in law, what would have happened differently in terms of the response of the statutory agencies? So that's the first question. So I, I, I thought a lot about this, obviously. So and, and if we look at education, I, I think once we came, once we got over the initial you know, we, we, we went into lockdown quite quickly, obviously, and we weren't necessarily prepared. But I think when we when we look back at COVID um, and how we we um, supported children's right to education, I think we'll find that we weren't as vigilant as we could have been. And when I say we, I mean schools and I mean the Department of Education and I mean EA and I mean CCMS. I don't mean teachers. I think teachers, you know, it, that's a whole that's a, a different a different thing. I think we didn't act quickly enough to ensure that we were we were maintaining a good quality education in the circumstances that the children were in. You, you, we weren't we're not re replicating the curriculum. We're not replicating a, a, a school day in ho in homes. But did schools are we confident that schools were supported enough to ensure that children were able to progress in their education within the circumstances they found they're in? It was recently described to me by a parent uh, was that our school set homework 
they didn't educate my child during COVID. And I think that's a, I thought that was a perfect way to describe what's been going on. Yeah. And then the other thing to, and the other thing to say is, um, you know, we know we didn't respond. We haven't identified and responded quickly enough to those children who've not necessarily had the tech to be able to engage in online education. We haven't necessarily been able to follow up as the, oh, I think we'll probably find that we weren't as vigilant in following up with those children who we weren't hearing from, who the system wasn't hearing from, who weren't logging on. Whereas if you have a right that says um, the child has a right to an education that develops their talents, skills, personality, and ability, that's a non-negotiable. That doesn't say a child has a right to go to school. It says a child has a right to education. And that education applies whether you're in lockdown or not. So I think it, 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 may, it, it would have then said, we're legally obliged to continue to do this. In, in, in a far more robust way. I do also think that the guidance, and it may have compelled the, the guidance coming out from the Department of Education to be a little bit more instructive and less, um, what's the word I want to use, less advisory. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the second question is really around the troubles related transgenerational trauma and I suppose there's opportunities now coming with the new mental health champion and the 10 year strategy coming out to Department of Health. So in some ways, would, would a lot of this Lexi stuff not still be dealt with through policy and programs as opposed to through the courts and, and again, why, why do you think, how do you think the children's rights embedded in disability rights would actually make any difference to that? So it's it's really interesting. I think so. You could argue you could argue the well. We'll sort it out in policy for all the issue, all the issues are coming out of the conflict, and we and we haven't done that. We haven't been able to do that. And and I'm actually it's quite interesting when you look at when uh, back in two thousand um, back in two thousand and ten. Uh, when the Northern Human Rights Commission advised government that they should have child rights clauses in the Bill of Rights, they responded by saying that they didn't consider that the proposed that those proposals met the criteria of um, reflecting the particular circumstances so that children didn't need protecting because they weren't affected by the particular circumstances. But we know children are. And to be honest, Paula, in the last 20 years, if you look at all the agreements, whether it's the Good Friday Agreement, the St. Andrews Agreement, um, Stormont House, um, and to, to a lesser extent, Fresh Start, and, and the, the four criteria for, for the legacy institutions, children are absent. Children, children are completely absent. Their voice isn't heard. Their experiences aren't heard. Yet we know, and quoting our, our new interim champion, we know that fifteen that she estimates in a report she did for the Commission for Victims and Survivors, she es estimates that fifteen percent of mental ill health is as a result as a, as a result of the conflict. We we are not talking to our children about the conflict. We are not listening to him about to them about how it impacts on them. And yet, what we what we know, what the evidence tells us, when we look at social disadvantage, when we look at educational and health inequalities, it's in those communities that were most directly affected by the conflict. When we look at how our education system is structured, it's all, conf you know, it, it's rooted in the conflict. And that doesn't even begin to address uh, paramilitary, so-called paramilitary style or armed gangs behavior. And we are not protecting, we're not listening to and we're not protecting our children the way we should be. So in, enshrining um, the, uh, the UNCRC in a Bill of Rights, we'll say to our children, Yes, you have been affected by the con in a different way, in an absolutely a different way from people who are victims of the conflict. I'm not saying children are victims of the conflict, they're not, but they are impacted on by the conflict. And they, the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland apply to their lives in the way, in, in, in a different way, but they have a right to have that met and recognised and addressed uh, as anybody else would. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Okay, Paula. John has indicated too. Okay, can you hear me? Uh huh. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, again, an interesting presentation and an interesting briefing document, and particularly in terms of the evolution of, of rights over a period of time, and even from the, the, the Good Friday Agreement was first negotiated back to, uh, all those years ago. And I note Kula's comments about the lack of the voice of children in that and subsequent documents 
uh, as well, which I think is a very uh, good point to be made and something that uh, we, we have to take on board, not only in this committee, but outside this committee as well. Though I think it's also worth pointing out that, of course, there's a legacy of the conflict, um, but we're in a much better place than we were 22 years ago. And even when we learn from the experiences of South Africa and the experiences of America around tackling division and uh, inequalities, it, it isn't solved by one document, it isn't solved by one piece of legislation. Um, there has to be momentum constantly behind it. And one of the concerns I do have is that we're beginning to have, well, we're, we're maybe even more than beginning, we're having a, a, the North is beginning to fall behind other parts of these islands once again, uh, in particular around children's rights. And I, I thought the presentations last, or two weeks ago, uh, from the, the Welsh and Scottish counterparts, uh, was very, very interesting. So I think your, the points you are making around uh, the inclusion of the UNRC and the future Bill of Rights uh, is very valid. But I just want to ask you in terms of... Uh, uh, a Bill of Rights is a very abstract idea, I think, to many people out there. They're, they're, it doesn't, in their opinion, impact on their daily lives. And I'm just wondering in terms of children and young people, and I note uh, your, your comments, Kula, with your discussions with with young people, with the promises government has made to you, how how do we make uh, rights uh, 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 understood to, to citizens? And this goes back even to Kayleigh's presentation beforehand, making people uh, legally proficient in the sense that they understand they have rights and how they access those rights. So how do we how do we uh, motivate young people to um, to 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 demand? these rights to demand a progressive society, to demand a new way forward, to uh, ensure that they're, they're part of, of building a new society, that their voices are heard as well? I think, um, uh, thanks for the question, John, and I think you're absolutely right. We need right, We need to make rights a reality. And, and the first thing, and one of the things that we're quite concerned about is that sometimes people think rights are these abstract things that you just make, make up as you go along, which is why the UNCRC is so important, because it's actually a thing. It's actually 42 rights that have been developed and there's a lot of initiatives about explaining what that means for children but actually do you know what i don't think we need to motivate our children i think our children are really motivated you have any session that says you know uh, in your in your constituency your local mla is coming and wants to hear young people's events you know will be will be uh, will be packed because young people want to talk about their rights and they want they one they want to, we have a responsibility to make sure they understand what they are the, you know the tangible rights and then you as decision makers uh, along along with your colleagues have responsibility to take to demonstrate that you take that seriously to demonstrate to young people that when they when they pack out these rooms when they take part in webinars when they visit the assembly when they're on their school councils when hopefully um we get a youth assembly in northern ireland that you that you are actually not just paying lip service to listening to them that you are giving them the voice so that they can have the influence that, that, that so they can have the influence to make a difference so what i would say to you john is that it's a transactional thing uh, we, we all have responsibility to make sure our children are able and ready what i have seen is that they are they're up for it what i'm less confident in is that those with the power are willing to listen properly and make the changes where they can um, that the children ask them to make. And and, and that's um, it's a hard truth, but it's true nevertheless. Um, we pay too much lip service to listening to our young people. Um, I can see Mairead wants to wants to jump in there. But yeah, it's 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 I suppose the question back is what are you gonna do about it as as a decision maker and as as one of our political leaders? Sorry, Mairead. Um, just as an example of that, actually, because we did a, a piece of work about a year and a half ago around children as human rights defenders um, and young people engaged with that very effectively. They actually attended the day of general discussion at the UN. Um, as part of this, they produced a report on their own experience and what it was like living in Northern Ireland as well. 
And it is, it, it's absolutely key that we listen to young people. And this is about making sure that the rights that actually say we will listen to you, like Article 12, Article 3 in terms of best interest, listening to our young people actually will make a difference. Because after a while, if young people feel that they're not being listened to, that anything they say doesn't matter, then they will disengage. It's about making sure and encouraging them to understand they do have a vested interest in their own futures and their own society, and they are being listened to by the duty bearers. You know, children and young people are rights holders. It is government who are the duty bearers and have that duty to make sure that young people feel listened to and that they do influence public policy. And we do look at civic engagement in the broadest sense, which includes children and young people. And you're talking half a million almost citizens of Northern Ireland here as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's me. I think we've lost uh, Mark from the call. He hasn't dropped back in yet. So um, if members have no other uh, comments, I'd thank you both for your time. Maria and Kula, thanks for joining us. And uh, that was very thank useful. Thank you. Um, so appreciate uh, you joining us today. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. All thank right, you. See you later. Bye. So uh, we can now move to the third item on our agenda, or the fourth um, so this is chairperson's business. So this is just uh, like a, it's a sort of a, a procedural matter, um, just in terms of committee input on freedom of information during the summer recess. So we're going off now for, for the, the summer recess and it's normal practice for committees to delegate authority to the chairperson and vice chairperson during these periods of recess to submit views on the releasing or withholding of information in any non-routine contentious freedom of information requests received. So if you agree to this delegation of authority, the committee will be advised of any such requests, uh, the views expressed by the chairperson and or deputy chairperson and the response issued by the Freedom of Information Unit at the first available meeting following the recess period. So if members are content that we continue with this practice as pair and members in video conference, same. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so agenda item five is our draft minutes. The minutes for our last meeting um, held on the 18th of June are at page 97 of the pack. If members are content, we can agree them. Yeah. And we have no uh, matters of reason. Ah, well, Chair. Okay. Embarrassingly, yeah. uh, on page 99, uh, there are some notes of comments I made, including saying that if we paid five panel members £500 a day, two days a month, it would come to £10,000. Whereas the correct answer is £5,000. Mathematics. So I will withdraw my application to be the accountant to the committee <laughs> and ask if it is voted that, 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 that I double that. Mayor. But also, Chair, um, just reviewing the, the conversation last time, um, and I'm, I'm just sort of noting the point, I'm not having a go here, but you, you said that it was the role of this committee to bring forward a report to achieve and deliver a Bill of Rights. But actually our terms of reference are to consider the merits of bringing forward a Bill of Rights. So I just, again, yeah, want to make that point. That's fine. Thanks for that. Um, so we have no matters you're raising. Um, correspondence is item number seven. Um, so you'll just find at page 105, we've got the correspondence memo. So uh, the correspondence is largely um, responses from a number of individuals that have agreed um, to give evidence to the committee after summer recess and this has been included in the forward work programme, Michelle. Just, just in relation to that, was there a decision taken that the correspondence themselves wouldn't be included in the pack? I don't see the attachment of correspondence. Other than just the summer. Generally, just when they're emails, um, we, we would just tend to include it in a table if members wish to see the content we can put emails in. Um, yeah, no, if, just if you wish. in normal committee, we would tend to see the body of the Letter. correspondence as opposed to just the summary. Hmm. That's okay. Uh, we, can, we can do that mm -hmm. going forward, Clark. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that point, um, notwithstanding, members in the room content to note the correspondence as set out. Mm -hmm. And in video conference, I see nods as well. So then, agenda item number eight, the forward work programme. 
Um, so this is the draft forward work programme um, from page 107. This is following summer recess. And if members are content to note, so the, the first meeting will be uh, the 10th September strategy afternoon, mm -hmm. um, which will be um, arranged during the summer and is, is likely to be outside Parliament buildings. So members will receive communication about uh, the detail of that as it is sorted. So if everyone is content, John, see you waving your hand. Uh, your, I'm just wondering, in, in relation to the presentation from the Children's Commissioner and our comments about hearing the voices of young people, mm -hmm. uh, could we do that? Could, could we arrange for a delegation of young people to present to the committee on their views? Uh, now, how you get a representative body of young people is, is open to interpretation, but perhaps the, the Children's Commissioner uh, could facilitate us in that, I think. It would be useful just to hear the voices of young people on this matter. Yeah, I would demonstrate a willingness to listen, Mike. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, would the Northern Ireland Youth Forum be considered representative? Potentially, yeah. Could could the clerk? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I have no fixed views on it. Um, maybe the clerk and, and the chair and the vice chair maybe take a look at take a look at it and come back with suggestions if that's appropriate. Is that the yes, um, Assembly Communications and Outreach are drawing up a plan for the committee which will be presented to members at the strategy afternoon. Um, that's something we can explore in, in greater detail at young people. Um, I know other committees in the past have used, um, well, not traditionally, but school groups would be coming through and in focus groups. Obviously, the current situation makes that more problematic. But there's a range of ways with which we could be engaging with young people. So we'll explore that further and come up with options. Okay, if everyone's happy. So the date time place of next meeting is Thursday the 10th of September and I wish you all a happy recess. Thank you. Much. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.